DEF CON convention. This meeting was held in exciting Las Vegas, Nevada from July 9th through the 11th, 1999. This is video tape number six, Firewall Appliance, Friend or Foe. I'm Darimo. I'm from Columbus, Ohio, uh, 614, and I'm the alpha dog of the wolf pack up there. We just completed a comprehensive review, it took about six and a half months, of some 23 uh, appliance firewalls. And we're going to talk about that today, some of the things that we found. If, if you were at Black Hat, uh, you covered, we covered what we found there as successes and failures. Today we're going to talk about a little bit more about the failures and some of the things that we found kind of hard to believe. So go ahead, next slide. I guess right off the bat we should talk about what is an appliance firewall. When we started this whole process, we went out to the web and just did a search on the keywords appliance and firewall. We came up with several hundred products and what we immediately determined was that our, our definition of an appliance firewall and vendors definitions of appliance firewalls vary greatly. So we're going to talk a little bit about what we kind of thought about an appliance firewall. We'll talk about some of the technologies that these products used and we'll talk about how you in the field can know these devices when you see them and why that's advantageous to you. And theoretically, we'll talk about what weaknesses they possibly might, could, might have. And uh, yeah, the lights would be good. You can, yeah, that's great. That's even better. Uh, let there be light. Fantastic. Ambiance. Ambiance. And uh, following the weaknesses part, we'll talk about how you can test yours or others' firewalls and uh, where you can find out more about these types of appliances. Next slide. First of all, we talked about what appliance firewalls are. And we were looking for devices that were integrated hardware solutions. We wanted all the software, including the OS, to be preloaded on the platform. Uh, early in this process, we came up with a term that uh, we borrowed from the MS folks again. We kind of took on the plug and pray attitude with these uh, firewalls. We were looking for something that was easily deployable. We didn't want to have to hold hands to a bunch of uh, folks who weren't skilled administrators in the field once these were deployed. And we were looking for something that could provide dual home network access. Uh, that's pretty much where we started with this whole process. We weren't really looking for something to firewall off a modem connection uh, or something like that. We were looking for something with dedicated network access. And immediately what we discovered was most of these, the majority of these products, the 23 that we actually reviewed, and there were about 34 to 37 that we tried to review. Uh, quite frankly, when we told some of the vendors that we were doing the review for DEF CON, uh, they just kind of laughed and didn't want to give us any products to review. So you guys might kind of carry that around with you. Maybe they're a little afraid of you. You can drop that in some interviews and stuff. Uh, <laughs> there won't be any names, unfortunately. Uh, attorneys have been already knocking. So, <laughs> yes, there will be a white paper available, uh, and I'll talk more about that at the end. Okay, the very first thing we discovered is the majority of these little devices uh, are based upon packet filtering technologies, and they were very simple access control list based. They simply compared the source and destination IP address, as well as what protocol you were speaking, and then decided whether or not to let it pass through the firewall and into the network. Some of them were active state, or uh, I guess they called it uh, uh, active content types of uh, devices. And uh, so we looked at some of those. And what that did is it built a state table in memory. And it said, OK, I shouldn't be getting a uh, SIN or an ACK, excuse me, an ACK from this, this area or this IP address speaking this protocol because I haven't initiated a session. Um, I don't know how much that bought you, but it was a little bit better, I guess. 
There were a couple of them that did application proxies. Most of them were basic services only, uh, your basic web, FTP, and uh, those kind of fell apart as soon as we started talking about real audio, real video, or anything else that a, a real company might be using. And a couple of them allowed you to create custom proxies on the fly. You could do your own uh, proxy from this address to this address, speaking only this protocol. There were a couple that were combination. And the last thing all of these devices do is network address translation. In fact, in some of them, it wasn't even an option to allow or disallow network address translation. You simply were natting whether you liked it or not. Next slide. Some of the things we discovered is that we looked at these for some cable modem type devices, and some did support DHCP on the external interfaces. Also, you might want to notice that DHCP on the external interfaces makes for some interesting uh, types of spoofing attacks and uh, the ability to possibly convince the firewall to release its IP address midstream. Uh, we kind of played with that stuff. All of them did port and address redirection and uh, there were two or three of them that had a possible DMZ deployment with a third network interface on the device. Many of them offered offloading of the logging, and that was, uh, that was a good feature. It let you move all of the log files to some other device. Of those that we tested, the majority of that information was passed in the clear between the firewall and the logging device. The interesting thing is the ones that didn't give the offloading of the device, because these are solid state machines, they only had a limited amount of memory to store those logs in. Support so flooding this thing would cause it to run right through the log files and hide all your earlier attacks on many of them. Also interesting to notice. A lot of them uh, did alerting via email, paging, SNMP, and just basic protections against spoofing. Uh, basically, it wouldn't allow you to, many of them wouldn't allow you to have uh, external, uh, or excuse me, internal IP addresses on the external interface because of the NAT. Now comes the good stuff. Now that everybody knows what an appliance is, and I can uh, stop being product boy. This is how you recognize them in the field. Right off the bat, because of the nature of the way these folks deployed packet filtering, you will find many open high ports, ports above 1024. And these are not usually prevalent or existent in proxy-based firewalls. So if you find those above 1024s open or filtered via an NMAP scan, you'll know, for example, that this is probably a packet filter. You can also, many of these systems identified themselves via the web browser. Simply connecting to port 80 or port 8080 on the devices would pop up this great little banner telling you how to buy the product. Fantastic. <laughs> if, by the way, if you're in marketing and you think that this is a great way to market a product, stand up because we all love you. Okay? <laughs> Telnet and SSH were also in use in these devices, and amazingly, once again, marketing, 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 Telnet in, and it tells you what kind of device it is. Many of these were solid state, as I mentioned, so you couldn't even change or disallow those banners. You gotta love that. The basic services may identify the types of devices. In this case, we were able to actually guess which holes, or excuse me, which filters were in place, and we would, we would use that to identify the devices that were being punched through to the back side of the firewall. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Also, NMAP and CASO, we used those quite extensively in the testing process, and on many of them, we were actually able to, under, to identify the underlying operating system that uh, was laying under the application. Uh, amazingly, most of these are based on this thing called Red Hat Linux. You might have heard of it. <laughs> Next slide. The real weaknesses that we're going to talk about today. First of all, the general lack of logging. Firewalls, in general, uh, most platforms do quite a bit of logging. So we were kind of amazed at the general lack of logging that was taking place in these little devices. Possible holes in the filtering rules, we'll talk about those and, and how to, to figure those out. DNS problems, address spoofing, some session hijacking. By the way, this is a great form of attack. This is uh, fantastic in this case. Possible exposure of internal systems and denial of service. Right, right off the bat, almost all of these firewalls 
they, all they did was log some type of connectivity. In many cases, they didn't even log dropped packets, only successful connections in and out of the firewall. Well, this is fantastic. We can port scan these devices all day, they won't notice, the admins never know. We can all kinds of play with some of these. The problem was, a couple of them did. They did record port scans, but when you looked at the dropped packet logs, unless you were a skilled administrator and saw that there was a series of packets from this port to this port, and over a period of time, you wouldn't realize that it was a port scan. None of these devices just came out and said, okay, a port scan just happened. So we kind of like that feature. Uh, you might want to know if you are going to uh, play with one of these devices and you don't want um, your co-administrator to know that you've been doing that, uh, you might want to use some type of stealth attack or stealth port scan, uh, like an Nmap thin scan or something like that. Be careful out there. Few log repeated connection attempts. In fact, we couldn't find any of these devices who would log the con repeated connection attempts such as in a brute force against a telnet prompt from a system that was exposed to the outside world. It just seemed to ignore it, that traffic was going there, so it must have been okay. Uh, so that's pretty useful. Brute forcing is kind of lame, but uh, at the same time, it is kind of nice to know that you can go ahead and play those games. None alerted against attempts to overflow exposed processes. And the big thing here that we discovered is these are like half firewalls, and they aren't really intrusion detection devices. Uh, again, part of this reporting process is that there was no clear way to identify what attacks had occurred. And uh, we kind of liked that. That was pretty fun. Almost none of them, maybe with the exception of two out of the 23, made any log at all of our attempts to denial or service the box. And we, uh, we hit these things pretty hard. And of the two that, uh, that did, many of them only just dumped basic Linux uh, log files, which you would have to go through and grep to pick out. Now, how do we take advantage of some of this stuff? Well, the first, first thing right off the bat are these filtering holes. If you were at Black Hat uh, you, and caught the extreme hacking uh, from Ian Y guys, you learned a lot about how this packet filtering stuff uh, can help and hinder you. And I've got just some words for you there. Netcat is your friend. Get to know Netcat. Uh, Firewalk is a great tool as well, and it can be used to help determine what filtering is in place, as well as locate possible holes in the filtering rules that allow you to map devices on the inside of the firewall. And that's very useful. Nmap will display the ports open by status as far as are they open, are they filtered, or are they firewalled. Uh, get to know Nmap as well. It is a great tool. They, most of these devices, as I said, allowed some uh, fin scanning of the internal network. And a couple of them, just we also noticed some things like ARP leakage, uh, where the device would, for some apparent reason, uh, start to ARP addresses on the external interface that belonged to devices on the internal interface. Uh, also could be useful. Once holes are discovered, and you've found ways to touch those internal systems, just exploit them using normal packets with forged source ports to reach the internal apps. And uh, you won't even have to do that for some of them. Some of them, like I said, expose systems to the outside. The next real fun one uh, for discovery were DNS problems. And because of the state of these devices and the way that they are created, uh, they try to get these to market as a pretty cheap price. And I'll answer that question right off the bat. They ranged in value anywhere from $600 to $20,000. Um, and it seemed to be that the the cooler the case was on the outside, the more expensive it was. Uh, so your mileage may vary. But misconfiguration of these solid state DNS servers was very common. And here we showed a kind of a little example of using NS lookup, where you uh, set type to authoritative, set the devices your DNS server, and then just simply do an ls minus d with the domain name, and voila, usually it would dump out all of the internal IP addresses. Thank you. That's always fun to play with.
Address spoofing, spoofing the source address may allow you to pass through the specific packet filtering rules. And spoofing addresses on the internal interface may allow you to access to internal hosts. Now, what you have to be careful of here is that the folks on the inside are not using non-routable IPs. If they are, obviously you're not going to be able to spoof those internal addresses unless you're on a local segment. So keep that in mind. Uh, spoofing the addresses of other perimeter systems may allow you to access to, uh, host applications. We found in some cases that as long as you were in the same class C as what the external interface of the firewall was, there were some inherent rules that weren't defined in the ACLs that applied to you. And uh, you might want to be able to play with some of that stuff. My personal favorite here, session hijacking. This worked really well against these appliance devices. And what, all we did was we uh, gathered connected users, in many cases, simply by fingering the device, finger uh, just at the IP address, and it would tell us many, many times how many or what users were logged in. So we would wait until we saw somebody connected to the firewall, and we would use a tool like Hunt to grab their session and voila, we've already authenticated, we're through, and we don't have to hack anything else. We've uh, already taken control of sessions. This is uh, probably the big one here. Those that didn't deploy proxy-based uh, traversal of the firewall just simply said, any connections on this port, such as port 80, route to this internal device. And what that did was, it allowed us to carefully probe and examine those systems that were exposed. Uh, for example, we could look at banners of the systems, and oftentimes we could query them, such as SendMail or other types of systems, to find out exactly what those operating systems were on the inside. Obviously, if you scan the firewall and it comes back and that determines it as a Linux box or a Linux-based OS, and you see this fantastic email system called Exchange, well, you know what's going on there. You know it doesn't run on the same platform. Uh, so query those applications for system and version information, and you'll be able to figure out exactly how to exploit those devices while passing through the filter. Next was uh, denial of service, or DOS attacks. And right off the bat, I want to tell you, these are pretty lame unless you have something to gain. And so all of you folks who are DOSing all these servers around the country, I say thank you because I get to travel and see the world and, and they write checks, and that's very cool. <laughs> uh, we did run into a few things here. Obviously, historically, there's been this problem where if you could DOS a firewall, and sometimes, in some rare occasions, those older firewalls, and some newer ones, would fail in a completely open state. And the application would simply crash, and it would start to route traffic between the interfaces. We couldn't get that to, uh, to uh, occur in any of these devices uh, that we tested. However, just be aware that that sometimes does exist. Also, we talked about, and we weren't able to exploit, but we really think that this is the case in some of these devices, as well as other firewalls on the market, where you could DOS the box and wait for it to reboot. And as it started to reboot, it would load routing before it would load the ACLs. So there was a period of time there where you could route traffic across the device without passing through the access control lists. And that could be very, very uh, fun to play with at some point. Uh, again, we couldn't uh, find any, t any time frames in those uh, devices that we tested, but we have heard that they are out there. And so you might play with those. Typical denial of rules or denial of service rules apply. Malformed packet attacks. Uh, we were able to DOS a couple of the firewalls that way, just simply crash the stack. Uh, normally, what would happen, the firewalls wouldn't reboot. Simply, the external interface would just uh, stop functioning and stop responding. Bandwidth socket attacks. Obviously, if you have more bandwidth than your target, you can suck up all the sockets. Nobody else gets connection. Very lame, but uh, I guess it might buy you something if you're really pissed. Floods and smurfs. That just general kind of stuff. Go ahead. Some of the other issues that we we kind of uh, discovered in this whole process was that some of the appliances pass management information in the clear. And we discovered in some cases that 
you could actually remotely manage the firewall once you caught those sessions and intercepted passwords. Uh, that's very, very useful. And uh, some of these packages came with browsers or custom applications that you would load on your, on your system. And it might be possible to spoof management information, whereas you might be able to change the ACL remotely. What percentage of those devices allow you to, to have managed to go to the database? I know it's selfish. You can't configure it. Um, I'd say about half, about 50% of them allowed remote management uh, from the external interface. How many of them that on by default? Uh, on by default. Off the top of my head, I'm guessing maybe another half of that, so maybe a quarter of the total deployment. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, I'm sorry. The question was uh, how many of those devices allowed external, or excuse me, management from the external interface, and then how many of them uh, allowed that on by default. And about 12 of them out of the 23 uh, allowed you to manage the firewall from the external interface or remote device. And of that, about six of them had that on by default. In fact, there were two or three of them that you had to manage uh, from the external interface when you first plugged the device in. You couldn't manage it from the internal interface of the firewall. The other question, uh, the other issue that we ran into is the same as in any other firewall. If you're a firewall administrator, uh, I, I pity you because misconfiguration of these devices as well as others is incredibly simple to do. Uh, the ACL rules are oftentimes pretty difficult to understand and even harder to figure out how to deploy in the order of significance. We ran into some that read bottom to top, top to bottom. It wasn't documented anywhere and half the time we call support and they wouldn't even know. Uh, so if you're dealing with software vendors too, uh, the one thing I have learned through this process as I explained at Black Hat is I really pity you guys. Uh, the vendors and support people were incredibly unresponsive and uh, it's just, I couldn't believe it. Uh, I'll get off my soapbox now. Uh, the misconfiguration issue, we found out that some of them allowed all the interfaces to be set to the same devices, uh, the same IP address. Allow, I mean, think about no sanity check, here it is. Uh, these things would become bridges and route traffic everywhere, all three interfaces. Uh, so we kind of like that too. Now if you own your own appliance and you want to test it, here's how to do it. First of all, take a sanity check on your access rules. Uh, take a look at what you're doing. Figure out if you're going to pump data from the external interface to the internal interface. Where is it going? What's it doing? Uh, that's right off the bat. Use some of the mentioned tools that we talked about to test your own firewall. If you have this appliance firewall and you, um, those of you who are security consultants or working in the field, uh, you deploy these without testing them yourself, hey, all we can say is come to DEF CON again next year and we'll give you a beer or something. We, we thank you. Uh, use an automated scanning tool if you can find those out on the net. There are some commercial products if you have a budget. And lastly, I had to mention this one just for all my friends who are doing this. Hire a security professional to uh, audit the firewall for you. We'll be happy to do that. And, uh, next slide. If you want to find out more about these, there's going to be a white paper uh, that we will put out. It will be on www.microsolved.com. We're hoping to have that up by the end of the month. We had meant to release that here, uh, but we've been having some problems with attorneys and getting people to sign off on uh, some of the NR or NDAs. The search. Can you repeat the domain? Yeah, www.micro solved, that's S-O-L-V-E-D dot com. Uh, yes, and here's how. The, the question is, if support can't help you on, uh, on that, how can, on the question of importance of the ACL order, how can you do that yourself? The first one is, uh, don't reinvent the wheel, check with the firewall wizard's mailing list. Some of those folks out there have used these devices. If you want to test it yourself though, set up a couple of rules such as uh, the first rule in the set, allow access to port 80 on this device. Uh, the second rule would be deny access to port 80 
to this device and then see if you can access it. Try switching them around and you'll figure out which one is in order of importance. Um, so do that in your testing phase. Did that answer your question? Yes? Yes, okay. Uh, hopefully by the end of this month if the attorneys get everything done. Uh, www.greatcircle.com will have uh, a lot of the information about the firewalls, the appliance firewalls. Uh, there are some folks out there that are working on that stuff. And there were several security and networking magazines uh, that have done a couple of reviews on these, so check those out. And lastly, if you have other questions, feel free to ask me. And I want to thank you guys for coming. I'll answer any questions uh, that you guys have. Classified the Nokia device in the firewall appliance? Uh, yes, yes, we do. And uh, we did look at that device, and there will be information about it in the white paper. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at the higher end stuff like to say fix a we we did everything from just pick two firewalls uh, from Sonic Wall. The question was what firewalls were included, uh, and I'm not going to go into a specific list. But we went everything from Sonic Wall all the way up to twenty five thousand dollar appliance firewalls, uh, such as the picks and things like that. The only thing that we could figure out price correlated to was how cool the case was. I mean, literally, some of these devices that we, we looked at were $600, and they did a much better job than some of the devices that were $15,000. Um, so, yeah, and I, and I want to answer another question that came up at Black Hat right off the bat before I take another. Uh, some other folks have asked me what, if there will be a current, uh, another review or an extended review to this and if we will continue this process and the answer to that is probably not and we, what we want to do is turn this over to the community and we want to hear from folks who are testing these firewall devices and if you want to add stuff in we'd like to create a living document to let you do that so that'll be coming up as well uh, it took us about six months to test all the firewalls. There were, the question is how long and how many. Uh, it took about six months to do that. We tested 23. We started with a field of 34. Some vendors were non-cooperative. We did. Uh, we only included in the white paper whether or not they included VPN technology. The question was, what did we do about the VPN technology? Did we test that? We did not do any uh, crypto analysis or any type of uh, other application analysis of the VPN stuff. Do you see a reason why this couldn't be done quote white? Do you think somebody will? <laughs> Good question. Uh, well, the question is, do I think someone else could do this right, and do I think someone else will? Um, I think that uh, there are folks out there who are testing these firewalls. I think we needed to do it in a manner that uh, these folks can understand and that suited our needs. So as far as that is, I think we did it right. Uh, but beyond that, if you guys want to do it, go out and test some firewalls. No, I mean, do the firewall right. Do the appliance firewall right. Yes, yes. Um, I think after looking at these 23 firewalls, uh, I think what we did find was that there is a future here. Uh, these plug and play devices are, are incredibly robust for what we were expecting. Uh, and I think in the future you will see that. I'd say within the next year to two years, you'll see a very robust uh, application proxy based appliance that is affordable for folks that are using small and home offices and cable modems. So, yeah. Did you, uh, let's say, the print in the, uh, the packet uh, inspection techniques in terms of you know, performance or quality? Did we know, I'm sorry, one more time. Did you notice any difference in the, uh, how the, in the packet inspection techniques, whether it's the or or the, the question is, did we notice any difference in the packet inspection technologies, whether it was stateful or not? Um, stateful inspection did help a little bit. We weren't able to uh, do some of the some of the less ankle biter attacks against them, um, but otherwise, 
you really didn't see too much benefit from it. Um, and obviously, there are some cases out there where uh, it will help some attacks and it will halt some attacks. So as far as performance went, we didn't see any implication of, of any problems either from that. Uh, as we know, uh, a lot of this configured firewalls cause a lot of problems. And keep the access list, how many of them actually have like an implicit denial that is automatically added? The question is, uh, misconfiguration is the greatest problem encountered by firewalls and firewall administrators. Uh, so how many of these came with an initial deny all state that uh, was at the end of the rule set? The answer was less than half. Yeah. Yeah. Do any of these firewalls have like a certification of ICSA and IAPRI? And if they did, did it correlate to how good it was? Wow. Uh, <laughs> the, the question is, uh, did any of these firewalls have ICSA certification, and did that correlate to how good it was? Uh, yeah, I'm going to answer that. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, some of them did have ICSA certification, and I couldn't uh, honestly tell you how some of them determined that that was ICSA certified. And if there are ICSA folks here in the audience, I'm sorry. I'm just calling it like I see it. With respect to that, that question, do you really care if it's ICSA certified? What is the certification? The, the question is, do I care if it's ICSA certified because uh, they fuck, they uh, <laughs> they just simply write a check and along comes the certification is what he's implying. Uh, and I, I would say no, I don't care if it's ICSA certified. In fact, uh, it means absolutely less to me if it's ICSA certified. I'm, when I deploy a security device for a client or for my own use, I want to know how it works and that it does what it's supposed to do. And uh, I could care less about any of the other stuff. Uh, another misconfiguration question. Like, uh, I, I do a lot of work at the checkpoint, and there's just like, a few things you got to know that you are leaving by default. We're not even in the rule base, so like the technical properties. If you don't change them, you leave big holes open. Uh, aside from that, it's pretty good. Did you find anything like that? The, the question was uh, that the gentleman works with a certain X brand of firewall, and uh, <laughs> and that uh, there are things that you inherently must know in order to secure the device. Did we find things like that? Uh, yes, we did. We found some ACLs that were just completely uh, unexplained as to how to configure them correctly. And uh, the whole thing is, if you were a black hat, you kind of heard my little rant there that I got off on, and I'm not going to do that today. Uh, just about how bad support sucked. On, this, on these products, we would call up and, and ask, you know, folks that uh, didn't even seem to know what packet filtering was, let alone uh, what to do about it. So I apologize there. Go ahead. Actually, I like one of the best. Uh, I called ProPoint.com. Uh, you know, it said, uh, you know, I was looking for the, the admin password by default. Should have gave it right out. The, the gentleman was just letting you folks know that you can find the default admin passwords on fopoint.com. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, sir. I got a question. I'm going to do this to see if I'm a little ignorant here. Uh, you go with your firewall, right? And I have certain rights to get free the firewall itself. And I left my computer on when I left work. Now, if somebody's going to do me, could you put your head cap in to my system without asking the firewall since I already got through? The, the question is, if he leaves his device, his computer as he goes home and he leaves himself logged into the network and his computer's turned on and he's protected by one of these devices, is it possible for someone to access data on your device? Uh, the answer to that is yes, determined on how uh, determined these folks out here in the audience are. Um, so uh, those of you who have some of his data, could you give it back? He, he just realized what happened. <laughs> Oh, good, great question. The question was, did we see any open BSD based appliances? Uh, there were two out of the 23. Uh, the open BSD. Can't name any names, I'm sorry. Uh, they did they did pretty well actually. The question was how did they do in the process? Uh, they did do pretty well. What we found was that many of the devices that were uh, Unix based or Linux based 
amazing, uh, and BSD-based were much more resistant to denial of service attacks than those that were using custom implementations. Uh, for some of these folks, they still, if you're writing a, an appliance firewall and you're still using a proprietary like operating system, um, we like you and you're our friend. Keep coming and make new revisions. We just, we love that. You mentioned some of them are doing application proxies. What's the level of content inspection? And then that brings stuff up to like the antivirus servers and stuff like that. Uh, the question is if, if they are doing content uh, inspection across a proxy, how deep is that? And are you able to offload virus scanning and things like that? Uh, we didn't find any of them that allowed you to offload virus scanning. Uh, we found a couple that included some toys that you could uh, kind of place in a DMZ situation that would allow virus scanning of content. Um, as far as the actual checking of uh, the data content within the proxy, that seemed to be fairly robust, although we didn't find any that were configurable in that manner. Uh, anything that was in a configuration issue kind of fell under that content blocking, filtering, I'm keeping you from going to XYZ site, uh, dot com kind of stuff. So. Are you going to be listing the names of the firewall in the, in the uh, white paper? We, the question is, are we going to list the names of the devices that uh, we tested in the white paper? The answer is yes for those whose attorneys will sign off and allow us to do so. That's what we're dealing with now. We. The whole end of this process turned into a big nightmare. It was like some of these vendors freaked out when they found out we were coming to DEF CON to tell you guys about it. So. More questions about boxes. You saying that some of them allowed you to create custom boxes. Would that actually just be like creating a package filter? Did you actually specify the commands that you allow for uh, the, the question was, how robust was the creation of the proxy process, uh, and would, could you specify what uh, data signatures or data loads you were looking to prevent? Uh, we didn't find any that were configurable to that manner. They simply said, you could build these custom TCPs that were kind of like packet filters, and it would make sure that the originating uh, service was indeed, you know, XYZ and this target. So, yeah, it was a little more than graceful packet filtering. Yeah. Any other questions? One for you? Yeah, some of those Linux based firewalls, we've been told by some of the vendors that just, it's Linux, but it's a stripped down version of Linux for security purposes. Are you going to turn that on any of the firewalls? And if so, what tool would that indicate that? Uh, the question was some of these, we've heard that they would possibly use stripped down versions of Linux uh, as code, and, and how would we find out? We were not able to determine that. Uh, in fact, some of them, uh, our favorite ones, seem to be a full implementation of Linux in this appliance device with a really cool front end. And uh, it did some really awesome things, and you'll see some of that in the white paper. So. Uh, are any of the network address translation capable firewalls that you dealt with capable of handling the handling against the 323 packets? Uh, the question is, were any of them, any of the appliance firewalls that we dealt with capable of handling H323? Uh, and I'm not sure we didn't, uh, we didn't test that. Uh, I want to I wanna mention to you, to you guys as well, uh, while talking about some of these uh, appliance firewalls, that we discovered some things here that you really had to play your cards pretty close to the vest when you were talking to the vendors. Uh, we found some that were significantly less than what we would classify as even a firewall. Uh, a couple of them were simply NAT devices that did no logging or anything. Uh, it just simply NATed your internal and external addresses. And then we found this one which I'll kind of read about again, uh, that when we asked for the firewall to, to uh, test, they sent us two. And we couldn't figure that out until we set them up and realized they were just point-to-point -point encryptors. They were not firewalls. Uh, so, uh, one, one more here. Did you ever mean these files capacity or what the intended application was? Was it like a T1 slower speed or was it the question was, uh, did we test throughput and capacity of the firewalls? All, almost all of them came with either 10 megabit ether or 10 100 megabit ether. We tested those. We didn't uh, test any of the others. We asked for some token ring implicate, or excuse me, implementations, and uh, we got back like, what's a token ring? Um, we 
we, you have to keep in mind that the majority of these devices are for small and home office users. So, you know, not outside of this room, not many people have T1s hanging out at home. So, uh, you know, that could happen here. Hey, I really want to thank you guys. I'm sorry I can't take any more questions. My time's up. Thanks for coming out to DC7. We'll see you soon.